Hey, welcome back everyone. Today I thought we would talk about the big question, what it really takes to become a trauma-informed organization. And I think my answer is actually quite different from what other people say, because I think other people focus on what actions should be taken, what needs assessments need to be done, or what services need to be put in place. And for me, I think that the most important thing is the moment, the moment when a person is about to become trauma reactive and how well everyone else can handle that situation without becoming trauma reactive themselves. Because what I've learned from doing interviews of offenders or students or anyone who uses these trauma-informed organizations is that the most important thing that makes or breaks a person's day is actually the moment-to-moment -moment interactions with people. And people as random as like the lunch lady in the cafeteria who will give you a full serving of food or not just based on whether or not they like you and how they feel that day. Or whether or not a safety officer will use excessive discipline just because they're frustrated with you. Those little moment to moment things are really what make people feel safe in an environment. And what I don't get is that the hospitality industry completely understands this. Every five star hotel or five star restaurant knows that service is the foundation upon which the whole experience rests. And so I really think that trauma-informed organizations need to take a hospitality mindset. And what hospitality means in a trauma-informed organization, I think, is that you're always being sensitive and attentive to the other person's needs and sensitive to their trauma reactiveness and the fact that you yourself are, can be trauma reactive and that you have to always guard against going to survival brain yourself and to amp up as much as you can your ability to stay clear, to stay purpose-driven and goal-directed and emotionally attuned to the other people. Okay, so then the first step in learning how to do that is actually to understand what your own survival brain looks like. Now for me, I know that when I get into survival brain, if I'm going into the aggressive mode, then I think people are stupid, that they have bad intentions, that they don't mean well, uh, that they're only doing things to hurt other people, and then whenever I go into the withdrawal phase, I just want to give up on a project, give up on the people, think that they're never going to change. So when I realize that I'm in that alarm state, the first thing I do is just to slow things down as much as possible. Because I know that my body's been activated and I have adrenaline rushing through me and I'm feeling intense feelings. And there's no way that I can just snap out of it. I have to let my emotions and my body cool down on its own. So I have to have a lot of patience for myself. I also try to scan my body and get grounded in it again. And I try to take some deep belly breaths and take control of my breathing again. And the other really important thing to do is that I try not to get mad at myself for getting into that alarm state. Because I know that my alarm has only been activated because something really important to me has, is going on. Or because I feel like something that I really care about is being threatened. And then once I do that, I try to figure out what page I'm on. And page is an acronym that I just made up that I think captures the essence of how to de-escalate from an alarm state. And the first step of PAGE is to really remember what my purpose is. And by purpose, I mean my purpose in life, in the kind of life I want to live, and in the values that I uphold. And then I try to remember how this moment can be a moment when I'm trying to live my purpose in life. And then the next thing I do is try to figure out whether I'm being emotionally attuned to the other person. Because as alarms go up, then self-absorption kicks up and I'm only worried about how this person's trying to attack me and whether or not I'm getting my needs and opinions across. And so this really helps me to slow down and pay attention to what's going on in the other person. And the next thing I do is to ask, what is the goal or intention of our meeting, this interaction, or even this very moment or this conversational turn? And when you're in alarm state, you forget what the goal is and all you care about is self-protection. But if you remember what your goal is, then that can help you to stay focused on what you really want to accomplish and what you want to say and do. And then finally, I ask myself, what am I really feeling? And oftentimes, the only things I can understand are the anger and frustration. So I have to dig a little deeper and ask, what is the hurt or the vulnerability that I'm feeling that I really don't want to express to the other person because I'm feeling threatened? And then I try to reorient my stance to express that hurt and vulnerability and feel confident that that's the only way that I'm ever going to get anything accomplished. And what I really want to say is that being in this clear, calm, purpose-driven state of mind is incredibly difficult and it takes hundreds and hundreds of hours of practice. I think of it like uh, being in great cardiovascular shape if you're an athlete. 
because you can learn a lot of techniques for being trauma-informed, and that's like learning the actual skills of your game. But to actually be able to execute all those techniques, you have to be in great physical shape. And to do that, you have to run miles and miles every day, and you have to keep training, and you can never let that cardiovascular endurance slide, or else your game just suffers. So this is really the most foundational, most important thing that people need to learn to become a trauma-informed person and then to help your organization become trauma-informed as well. Now, after you've done this for 100 hours of practice, then you can move on to some of the techniques that we'll go over in the next videos. Thank you.